Our scripture lesson for today is found in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for a word from God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare the, your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John, the baptizer, appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's a simple message. Prepare the way of the Lord. That's what John said. In fact, that is the only sermon that John ever preached, as far as we know. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make way for Jesus. Prepare for, for God's arrival. John believed that God was going to come, and he did. God came to live among us as Jesus Christ. And we believe that Jesus will come again. And we want to be ready, right? So how do we do that? How do we prepare ourselves to meet the Lord? Well, this time of year, we make a lot of preparations, even in a pandemic. We prepare our shopping lists and we prepare holiday meals. We decorate our homes and our yards and our towns. We string lights on rooftops. We hang ornaments on trees and we send letters to Santa. Advent is an entire season of preparation. In fact, we just about run ourselves ragged with all of our holiday chores. But that is not what God asks of us. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with trimming a tree and buying presents and cooking up a bunch of grandmother's favorite recipes. At their best, those things can represent beauty and love and tradition. And God appreciates things like that. But they are not what God asks of us. We don't prepare to meet the Lord by hanging stockings by the chimney with care. That's what we do when we're expecting Santa Claus. No, there is only one way to prepare for Christ's arrival. And that is repentance. We repent of our sins. We confess our wrongdoings and we turn away from them. We turn in a, in a new direction. We turn away from life as it is and we turn toward life as it could be. We turn toward life as God desires it to be. And that means we have to change. And nobody, I mean, nobody likes change. I mean, certainly nobody likes to have change forced upon them. <laughs> Lord knows, we've had enough of that this year, right? But we prepare for the coming reign of Christ through change. I mean, the world as it is is not what God wants for us. Conflict, greed, injustice, poverty, neglect, disease, hatred, fear, infidelity. I mean, things like this do not please God. They do not honor God. If we want to please God, change is required. But 
even when you want to turn your life around, even when you need to turn your life around, there are times when change seems impossible. Take, for instance, the story of William Griffith Wilson. Wilson grew up in a quarry town in Vermont. When he was only 10 years old, his father, who drank a lot, headed for Canada. Wilson's mother moved to Boston, and Wilson, who was a sickly child, was left with his grandparents. And despite physical limitations, the boy fought off depression and became captain of his high school baseball team. He even learned to play violin and played in the school orchestra. He went on to college where he earned a degree in engineering. Then at the beginning of World War I, he entered officer's training school. He was promoted to second lieutenant and at an army camp in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Wilson was handed his first alcoholic beverage. He drank to alleviate depression. And later, when he became successful on Wall Street, he, he drank to celebrate his accomplishments. And then he lost it all in the start market crash of 1929. Bathtub gin, bootleg whiskey, and New Jersey Applejack became the answer to all of Wilson's problems. By 1933, he and his wife were living on charity, and Wilson had become an unemployable drunk who disdained religion and panhandled for cash. A friend tried to help him, and Wilson was impressed by the man's story of recovery, but Wilson hadn't quite hit bottom yet. He had what he called one more prolonged drunk in him. Eventually, though, Wilson staggered into a treatment center in Upper Manhattan. He was sick, depressed, and clutching a bottle of beer. He expected to die or go insane as a hopeless drunk. Life had never seemed more hopeless. Change had never seemed more impossible, and yet Wilson did change. He was changed by the power of God. Remembering the advice of his friend, Wilson realized that he was licked. Alcohol had gotten the best of him, and he needed help. So he cried out, if there is a God, let him show himself. I am ready to do anything, anything. And suddenly, the room lit up with a great white light. Wilson later recalled, I, I was caught up into an ecstasy which there are no words to describe. It seemed that a wind, not of air, but of spirit, was blowing. And then it burst upon me that I was a free man. And that was the beginning of Bill W.'s long journey of recovery. Although there would be times when he would crave another drink, Bill found the strength through God to overcome his addiction, and he used his experience to found Alcoholics Anonymous, which has helped millions of addicts with their recovery. People can change. Jesus Christ gives us the power to change. In our gospel lesson today, John called people to repent of their sins and to be baptized. It was a ceremony that people carried out to show that they were going to make some changes in the way that they live. Underlying that baptism was and is the belief that we can change. But many people today believe just the opposite. They feel trapped by what is demanded of them at home or at school, at work, at church, in the community. 
They, they sense that others expect them to behave in specific ways and would be suspicious of any changes they might make, even if those changes were for the better. They feel powerless to change their behavior or to resolve difficult situations that confront their families and their friends and co-workers. But John insists that change is possible. He baptized people with water in order to call his listeners and us to make needed changes in our lives before we meet the Lord. See, that's how you get ready to greet the Messiah. That's, it's through repentance. But there's more to the story than that. Not only did John call his listeners to repent so that they would be ready to meet the Lord whenever he appeared, John also made them a promise. He promised that the one who comes would give people the power of the Holy Spirit so that they could make even greater changes. Not only are we called to make needed changes in our lives before we meet the Lord, we're also called to make changes in our world, and Jesus gives us the power to do it. There's a very familiar story. You probably have heard it, but I'm going to tell it again. It was December of 1914, and all was quiet on the Western Front. The war was only five months old, and about 800,000 men had already been wounded or killed. And everyone wondered whether Christmas would bring yet another round of fighting and killing. But something very different happened that year. British soldiers raised signs that read Merry Christmas. And pretty soon you could hear soldiers on both sides of the battlefield singing carols. Warriors laid aside their weapons and went to meet the so-called enemy. They talked and sang together and even exchanged small gifts. Candy and cigars, mostly. I mean, that's what they had. The one spot along the front, British soldiers played soccer with the Germans, who, I'm told, won three to two. For miles along the front, there was peace. In some places, this Spontaneous truths continued into the next day. Nobody on either side was willing to fire the first shot. The war eventually resumed when fresh troops arrived, and the high command of both armies ordered that further informal understandings with the enemy would be punishable as treason. And see, people can change. Jesus Christ gives us the power to change, but it seldom comes easily. And that's why Jesus came to us on that first Christmas so long ago to bathe us in the Holy Spirit, who gives us the power to do the impossible. I mean, through Christ, we even have the power to negotiate peace. And the best plan for peace that anyone has ever envisioned is found right at the Lord's table. And our liturgy for Holy Communion begins with confession. Communion begins with confession. It's the first step towards peace. Peace begins by admitting that you've made a mistake, that you were wrong, that you were the one who threw the first punch. It's saying, remember your favorite toy? I'm the one who broke it. Or, remember our wedding vows? I'm the one who broke them. The confession is saying, I was wrong. I sinned. And that's the first step toward peace. The second step is forgiveness. If you're the one who's guilty of wrongdoing, you apologize. You don't just say, I did it. You ask for forgiveness. You say, I'm sorry I broke your toy. Will you forgive me? Or, I'm sorry that I hit you. Will you forget me? forgive me? I'm sorry that I cheated on you. Can you please forgive me? 
Forgiveness is the second step toward peace. And as hard as it is to say, I was wrong. And as hard as it is to say, will you forgive me? That's nothing compared to change. Because the third step is change. It, it isn't enough to say I'm sorry. If you really want to make peace, you make amends. You fix what you broke. If it can't be fixed, you work hard, you save up the money, and you buy your friend a new toy. You work hard to rebuild your marriage. You take care of the person that you hurt, and you work really hard to regain trust. And then you take steps to ensure that things will be different in the future, that you will never repeat your mistake. Now, change is not easy. It's hard to say I was wrong. It's hard to say, will you forgive me? And it's really, really hard to change. And God knows that. God knows how hard it is for us to change. We just can't do it on our own. We need help. And that's why God gives us the Holy Spirit to help us change our lives and our world. The Holy Spirit comes upon us when we are baptized and the Spirit works within us to form us into the likeness of Christ. The Spirit will always be at work in us. And you know that's true because you feel guilty when you do something wrong. And maybe even before you sin, you hear that little voice telling you, don't do it. But over time, you, know, you get accustomed to the guilt and you learn to ignore that little voice in your head. You find yourself getting hungry spiritually. And you need a snack. You need something to, to give you a spiritual boost. So God offers us Holy Communion, a meal of grace, a meal of power and love, a, a meal of confession, a meal of forgiveness, a meal of repentance and peace. And somehow, in that mysterious way that only God knows, we become like Christ. Because you are what you eat, right? The hard truth is that we are all sinners. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Repentance is required if we want to be ready to meet the Messiah. So we come today to the table of our Lord where every heart can be changed. Our communion liturgy says that Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. O oh, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are the Lord be with you lift up your hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God 
it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always and the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen.